Hello and welcome. My name is Phil Lee and I'm a partner in the Privacy Security and Information team at Field Fisher. Four years ago, Field Fisher sent me out to the United States and asked me to open up an office for it out there. And I was sent out to Silicon Valley, the, the heart of uh, heart of technology worldwide. And my remit there was to work with US clients on their European data protection compliance. Now, in order to do that, I had to be able to translate European data protection issues into a sort of language and concepts that my US clients could understand. And of course, in order to do that, I also had to have a fairly good understanding of what the requirements were for them under US data privacy rules as well. And that's really the purpose of today's presentation, is to talk a bit about the differences between US and EU data protection, but also to help you understand where both regimes come from and what their similarities are. Now the presentation today, when I talk about European data protection law, I'm going to be talking about the law as it stands today, which is under the current EU data protection directive. But of course I'm sure you're very well aware that European law is undergoing reform and that with effect from May next year, with the, the new general data protection regulation, the new EU general data protection regulation will enter into force and replace the current directive. Don't worry though, because this the presentation today is very much um, speaking at a conceptual level between the differences between US and EU laws, so it's not going to get down into the sort of the nitty gritty and specifics of, of the current directive. So a lot of what I talk about today will remain just as valid under the GDPR as it is today. Anyway, let's move on. So first of all, this is a question I like to pose to anyone when they're thinking about sort of European and US data protection rules. Um, and it, I found it a particularly effective way of explaining to our US clients um, the, the importance of European data protection in the EU. So just think for a moment, what do these two things have in common? That's personal data and a firearm. Well, if you're wondering what the answer to that is, then it's this. Both are protected by constitutional-like rights. Um, obviously, if you are in the US, you may be familiar with the US Bill of Rights uh, and the Second Amendment in particular, which says that um, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that is a, that's a constitutional right in the U.S. And you know, I'm not here to take a take a sides on uh, gun control legislation or anything like that. But one thing you will find is that if you talk to any American, they will feel very passionately about this right, and they will feel passionately about it because it is a constitutional right. Now, over in Europe, we have this thing called the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. It's not quite a constitution. There are some differences, but it's the closest thing we have in the EU to uh, a constitution to your to your everyday folk it is effectively provides constitutional style rights now in Europe we view privacy as being so important that we have actually enshrined the right to privacy and the right to data protection in two separate rights we have article 7 which says that everyone has the right to respect for his or her private and family life home and communications and we also have article 8 which says that everyone has the right to the, to the protection of personal data concerning him or her. So there are two really important things to note from that. The first is that in Europe, privacy and data protection is seen as being so important that it is effectively given protection as a fundamental right, almost like a co the, the European equivalent of a constitutional right. That's how much we care about it. And not only that, but we care about it so much that we've enshrined privacy and data protection as, as separate rights uh, under Article 7 and Article 8. Now if you're wondering uh, what the difference is between privacy and data protection, then you know pri the way to think about it is that privacy enshrines data protection but it also includes other things. So for example, um, you know, privacy encompasses notions of trespass onto someone's property or uh, maybe bodily privacy. If you think about sort of um, for example, um, body searches at, at airports or in prisons. Uh, those aren't data protection issues, but they are privacy issues. Data protection, on the other hand, is concerned with the protection of personal data. And so, you know, both these things protected by constitutional light rights in the, in the EU. Now, if you're having conversations with, uh, you know, an American colleague and they're saying to you, you know, well, how much do Europeans care about 
data protection, how much do they care about privacy? Then you can say to them, well, you know, in, in Europe it's protected almost like a constitutional like right. And think about how much you care about the right to bear arms, whether you're for it or against it, just think about how much you care about that constitutional right. And then imagine that in Europe we have the same level of emotion about our data protection rights. And you'll find that when you explain it in those terms, it will quickly become very apparent to US colleagues how important data protection is to Europeans. Now, to truly understand the difference between uh, the US and European regimes around data protection, it's important to actually understand just differences between the, um, the US and the EU as geographic regions to begin with. So if you look at the United States of America, uh, you know, what is it? It is a federal republic, that's its government, it's a federal republic, it's, it comprises of 50, uh, 50 states in the Union, and it has one common language for the most part, um, you know, obviously uh, sort of Hispanic is now becoming a, a major minority language uh, in the US, but generally speaking, you know, throughout most of the US people speak uh, English. And it essentially has two key um, types of laws. It has federal laws, which are laws that apply throughout the, the US, um, and it has state-based laws. So, you know, California has a set of laws, you know, Maine has a set of laws. Each of these states, they have their own, uh, their own state-level laws. Now, if you contrast that with the European uh, Union, the European Union obviously is not a country, but it is an economic and political union of countries. Uh, you know, originally founded uh, at the end of um, the, the, you know, after the Second World War as a way of um, pooling coal and steel resources between a collection of member states um, again, to, to make sure that um, by sort of, you know, pooling those resources and, and sharing and monitoring them, um, you know, another uh, sort of situation like the, um, you know, what led to some of the factors that led to the World War couldn't arise again. Um, over time, it has grown to now encompass 28 member states in total and of those 28 member states you have 24 official languages so that immediately introduces um, you know one level of complexity that you know unlike the US where you're trying to communicate rules and doing so in a single common language in the US uh, sorry in Europe you have 24 official languages and um, the consequence of that being that you know when you're passing laws in Europe you know even uh, the way those laws are interpreted into national languages can give rise to differences. The other important thing to just bear in mind is that being a set of 28 different member states, you find that each of those member states has very different cultural attitudes. Um, you know, the, the sensitivity of, say, the British or the Irish to, uh, to European data protection is quite different from the sensitivity of, say, the French or the Germans or the Austrians. So, you know, you will get very different cultural approaches, you will get very different linguistic approaches, and of course you get very different legislative approaches. Which leads on to the final point about the European Union. You know, what kind of laws do we have? Well, in essence, we have, we have three types of laws. Um, at a very high level, we have these things called regulations. Uh, you know, what is a regulation? A regulation is a legal instrument that is passed at a European Union level and then that regulation applies throughout the entirety of the EU. So you have one law that applies throughout the entirety of the EU. Now that's contrasted with a directive which again is an illegal instrument passed at a European level or European wide level so it applies throughout the entirety of the EU but it doesn't it isn't immediately effective in each of the member states. What has to happen is that the directive just sets out the, the kind of the skeleton framework of how the law should work, but then it's up to the individual member states of the European Union to actually implement those rules into their national legislation. So, um, you know, if you like to put the flesh on the bones through national laws. So that's the way that our data protection law works today. We have the data protection directive, so it's a directive past the European Union level, but for that directive to take effect in each of the member states, every country has implemented its own national version of that directive. So in the UK, you have the, the Data Protection Act, uh, 1998. In Ireland, you have the Data Protection Act. Uh, uh, you, in Germany, you have the BDSG, um, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce in, in German. That's the abbreviation. But every country has its own national data protection law. And 
uh, as a consequence of that, you find that although they all stem from one common source, the directive, because there are individual national implementations and there are you know, different translations of some of the key concepts and some countries have decided to be more strict on rules than others, you get differences between the different countries as to uh, legally as to how they apply data protection rules. And then outside of though, outside of regulations and outside of directives and the way they're implemented, of course, you get some countries that have their own uh, data protection laws or privacy laws that don't stem from a directive or don't stem from a regulation. They're just national rules around handling data privacy. Now, I mentioned today that we have a data protection directive. Um, for those of you who've been following developments in the European Union, you may also be aware that uh, we are currently reforming our data protection laws and we are doing a root and branch reform and the plan is that our new data protection law is going to be passed in the form of a regulation. One of the concerns that's existed about the law we have today has been the fact that you have got all these variations between the different member states because of the way that they have implemented uh, their national data protection regimes from the directive. Under the new framework that we're looking to adopt, we are looking to adopt a regulation so that we will have a single data protection law that applies throughout the entirety of the EU in a uh, in a single, harmonised, consistent manner. Uh, now, there are some positives to that. It provides greater certainty for, for individuals. It provides greater certainty for business. But the flip side to it is that actually getting agreement between the member states on a single law that they're all going to be subject to is a very hard thing indeed. So this, the, the draft regulation, the draft new general data protection regulation was proposed in 2012. We're in 2015 and the member states are still debating what that law is going to look like. Uh, our best guess is that that law will probably be adopted sometime in 2016 and then when it is adopted it's got a further two year implementation period so it won't take effect likely before 2018. So that's the state of things today, but you can immediately see that um, at a very high level, the European Union is perhaps a more complicated regime than the United States is, at least culturally. So that leads on to the next question that I like to pose, which is just, you know, from what you've heard, from what people tell you, uh, would it, is it true to say that the, the European Union has stricter rules than the United States? Is that true or false? I'll leave you to think about that for a second. Well, I don't intend to answer that right now, but what I am going to do before we get to, the, to revisiting that question is just to give you a little bit of, back, uh, of history. Now, one of the um, one of the interesting things about data protection laws, wherever you go in the world, um, as of today's date, we have um, something in the region of uh, a hundred over a hundred data protection laws worldwide, and all of those laws, they you know, not just in the European Union or the United States, but in Canada and in Latin America and in Aus in the Asian Asia Pac region and Australia, New Zealand, all those kinds of countries, they all have their own data protection regimes. But the, and they all say slightly different things, but the interesting thing about it is they all have a sort of common set of core principles that underpin what those reg regimes say. And they are normally principles around uh, notice, or, you know, some element of transparency towards individuals about how their information will be used. They also include some notion of choice, that individuals should either be able to give consent or to object to the way that their data is being used. They have a notion of access to data, allowing people to access their information and maybe to correct or update it if it's become out of date. And they also have you know, a notion of security, um, that data should be kept secure. And there are other principles like that that collectively we refer to as fair information privacy practices. So if you're a privacy pro, everyone will talk about their FIPS, fair information privacy practices. Now, what most people don't know is that the concept of FIPS, the concept of fair information privacy practice, actually stems from a 1973 US Advisory Committee report on automated data systems. So the very first time they were proposed was in this US report on automated data systems. What then happened was that kind of concept of FIPS was then subsequently embodied in uh, data privacy guidelines that were published by the 
um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. That's a, um, a transnational group of countries that get together to promote uh, sort of, uh, economic growth and democracy uh, amongst their member con countries. And what they did in 1980 was they produced rules, uh, sort of um, voluntary rules that their members could adopt around um, around good data protection practices. And in doing so, they uh, they embodied those FIPS, those f things that stem from the US Advisory Committee report, into the OECD guidelines. And then after the OECD guidelines came along the Council of Europe Convention 108, uh, which was in 1981. The Council of Europe, a completely different thing from the European Union, uh, it, it is a, it's a um, much bigger set of countries in the European Union, and it includes countries like, for example, uh, you know, Russia as part of the Council of Europe, um, as is the Ukraine. Uh, and the the role of the Council of Europe is to promote human rights, really, amongst its member state uh, countries. And what the Council of Europe did was to um, was to really embed the OECD, the the, o the principles of the OECD, and these fair information. Pr uh, privacy practices into into this convention 108 which was a binding convention on the member states of the council of europe so what the effect of that was that countries that were members of the council of europe were then bound to actually introduce um, these data protection rules into their own uh, member states now what happened was that um, in the period between 1981 when that um, convention was passed and 1995 um, the member states of the Council of Europe, frankly, some of them implemented these these uh, new data protection rules. Some of them, even though they were supposed to, didn't. And the European Union paid notice to this. And in 1995, to really encourage the adoption of um, of data protection rules, the European Union uh, passed the 1995 Data Protection Directive. And um, the, the 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 Data Protection Directive was binding on all member states of the European Union and um, you know infringements of uh, European Union law are actually inf um, you know uh, uh, overseen by the European Commission who will take action against member states that don't implement directives and so when it when the when these rules were built into the European Data Protection Directive there was a really strong binding obligation on European member states to finally adopt national data protection rules that met the standards required by the Data Protection Directive and being imposed in the directive it ensured a good level of harmonization across the member states but all of this began with the fair information privacy practices that were first introduced in this 1973 US report so the incredible thing about this and the thing that most people don't realize is that modern day European privacy law owes its origins in part thanks to the United States So now that we know that, I think it's worth uh, doing a compare and contrast of the way that Europe, United States um, data protection rules and European Union data protection rules operate. Now, in the United States, um, the, the most important thing to know, and often the reason why the United States comes in for a lot of criticism, is that there is no all-encompassing federal data privacy law. And that's a really big difference from the EU. The EU has this data protection directive that applies throughout the entirety of the EU uh, and across all types of personal information, regardless of sector. The United States has no equivalent of that. But what it does do is have a bunch of sector-specific rules. So it has privacy laws that are specific to healthcare. You may have heard of, the, of HIPAA, for example, or it has rules that are specific to the financial services sector. Uh, so Graham Leach Bliley would be a good example of that. And although it doesn't have an all-encompassing federal data privacy law, there are uh, federal laws that are designed to address particular risks. We'll call them sector agnostic rules. So we have uh, laws that are designed to deal, for example, with um, the collection of children inf children's information online. Um, so, so COPPA, uh, as you'll hear people call it, the Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act. So outside of those sector-specific laws and those laws that are designed to address particular risks, 
there are also a bunch of state privacy laws. So the individual states, all 50 of them around the United States, um, you know, well not all 50, but some of the 50 around the United States have adopt, adopted their own state privacy rules. So California, for example, has the California Online Privacy Protection Act of 2003. And actually really interestingly, um, I'm going to call California out here because the, or, you know, we, we were talking earlier about constitutional rights um, enshrined in the US and the EU and actually what I should have mentioned to you was that while the US has a constitutional right to bear arms, it actually doesn't have, unlike the EU, it doesn't have a constitutional right throughout the entirety of the, EU, uh, the US to um, privacy. But California is a state, it has its own state level constitution and in that state level constitution the right to privacy is enshrined. So you'll find even in some states their constitutions actually protect privacy. Now over, uh, enforcement of um, privacy in the US is generally overseen by the Federal Trade Commission. So that's if you like the, the consumer protection regulator and what they do is that it, they enforce what uh, any trading practices that are seen as unfair and deceptive practices towards consumers. So, you know, what, what you might notice from that is that, first of all, the Federal, Trades Commission, Federal Trade Commission is a consumer um, protection authority. It is not, um, for example, an it doesn't protect employees, so it wouldn't bring employment data protection related enforcement actions. Um, the second thing you might note is that it's bringing it under this regime of unfair and deceptive practices. Now, unfair and deceptive practices is not specifically about privacy. It's a much broader concept. It could be, for example, misleading pricing on a website. But the the, the mishandling of individuals' uh, information in the United States or uh, making, you know, not living up to the promises uh, that you um, provide in your privacy policy, perhaps, about the way you will handle uh, individuals' personal information. In the United States, that is treated as an unfair and deceptive practice, and the FTC can bring enforcement about that. Now, we jump across the Atlantic to the European Union, and we do have um, federal-like data protection laws. Um, we have the Data Protection Directive, which is this umbrella framework of legislation that protects personal information throughout the entirety of the EU, as implemented in each member state by their own national laws. And we have this thing called the e-privacy directive, which is uh, legislation specifically designed to talk about um, protecting the privacy and confidentiality of communications uh, in the in the telecommunications and the ISP uh, sort of sector, um, public available public communications sector. But in particular, what that also does is it, it has some very specific rules within that that apply to everyone about the sending of uh, Mark electronic marketing communications, so email or SMS marketing communications or telephone or fax communications. It also um, is more popularly known as the cookie directive because it's this piece of legislation that uh, imposes this requirement on European businesses to get consent for the cookies they serve through their website. And again, that e-privacy directive is, is implemented in every member state through national local law implementations. So the European Union, we have these kind of two laws that apply across the entirety of the EU. Um, they're implemented into each member state. And then in each member state, you also have multiple data, sorry, in each member state, you also have a data protection authority. So uh, in Ireland, you have the Data Protection Commissioner. In the UK, you have the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, and in some member, in some member states, Germany in particular, the, you have multiple regulators for data protection issues. So Germany has 16 or 17 different uh, states within it as a country, and each of those states has its own data protection authority. So you may have heard in the past, for example, that um, Germany is considered a high-risk country for data protection compliance, basically because if you get it wrong there, you could be exposed to enforcement by any of those um, state authorities depending on you know where you are collecting and using data in Germany so uh, you know I, the, the the Peter Fleischer who is the global privacy council at Google he's previously said in the past if any of you read his blog that the that the EU has a simpler data protection narrative um, than the United States and what he means by that is basically privacy laws in the in the European Union they all essentially point back to these two key pieces of the legislation, the Data Protection Directive and the E-Privacy Directive. And those regimes, although there are 
differences between the member states, they're broadly harmonized throughout the entirety of the EU. Whereas when you look at the United States, it's not quite that simple. You have to look at sector specific laws, you have to look at sector agnostic laws, you have to look at state level laws, you know, and then you have this kind of overwhelm, uh, uh, overarching concept of unfair and deceptive practices that can be enforced by the FTC. It's, it's a much more complicated and I think some would say higher risk regime than Europe. So I mentioned that there are some sort of um, sector specific and sector agnostic laws. Just to give you an example of um, some of those laws, uh, the, main, the main piece of legislation in the US under which um, data privacy enforcement is brought is the FTC Act. That is the act that gives the Federal Trade Commission the authority to uh, bring enforcement for unfair or deceptive practices. Uh, equally, there's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA. That's the um, law that protects the children's personal information when they're collected on online. You'll see I say here PII because you'll find Americans will talk about the concept of personally identifiable information, whereas in Europe we use the term personal data. There is also the CAN Spam Act, the um, controlling the assault of non-solicited pornography and advertising material. Um, uh, Americans love abbreviations, the CAN Spam Act. And what that does is to create an opt-out regime for email marketing. That's a big contrast with the EU where we generally have an opt-in regime for email marketing. There are also things like the Fair Credit Reporting Act which protects the personal information that is um, supplied in credit reports. There's Graham Leach Bliley which protects personal information held by financial institutions. And there is a very significant piece of law called the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Quite a mouthful, more commonly referred to as HIPAA. And what that does is to provide health, uh, is to protect healthcare information that's processed by uh, what we call covered entities. So things like doctors and hospitals. Um, the the uh, HIPAA applies to them. And just to give you an example of a few of California's privacy laws, now this is where it gets really complicated. If you go to the California Attorney General's website, you will see within that they actually have a listing of all of California's privacy laws. And you know, as I mentioned at the outset, these are laws that are state level laws that are designed to address very specific issues. And it's an enormous list. I've given here on this slide an example of two screenshots. Um, from that uh, from that website, but actually, if you go there, that's the, those pages go on and on and on and on and on, and so you can see that if you're a business operating in the U.S., then you have to worry yourself about the fact that you could be exposed to you know tens, if not hundreds, of these laws from a federal level to a state level to the FTC. It becomes a very difficult thing uh, to manage. So how does the US actually enforce uh, enforce data protection um, compliance? Well, I've already mentioned at a federal level, uh, you have the, the uh, enforcement principally led by the, uh, by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, and they will pursue businesses that are um, engaging in unfair or deceptive practices in the way that they handle uh, people's personal information and they will see consent decrees from those businesses, basically promises from those businesses that they will bring their house in order and that they, uh, and that they won't um, infringe, they won't conduct any further unfair or deceptive practices when handling data. And those are very onerous, um, very onerous enforcement powers because typically um, what will happen is that businesses will settle with the FTC um, when they agree a consent decree and as normally as part of that settlement they can pay very significant sums of money and they can uh, or, uh, quite often be required to agree to 20 year audits of their business so you imagine that you know every year the FTC comes back and audits you to make sure that you are living and abiding by the standards set out in the consent decree um, in Europe we really have nothing um, that becomes even close to being that onerous in terms of uh, regulatory enforcement powers then at, uh, below the federal level, you have at a sectoral level, you have sector-specific regulators that uh, enforce those sector-specific rules we looked at. So, for example, the Federal Communications 
uh, Commission. Um, they are the regulator that regulates uh, in privacy breaches in the communications sector, so misuse of information by uh, telcos and by ISPs. And then at a state level, uh, you have the state attorneys general. Uh, so, you know, again, taking California as an example, um, they have the California Attorney General, which was the first Attorney General in the United States to open a specific privacy enforcement unit in their office. And then at a consumer level, and this is the thing that tends to really worry a lot of um, US attorneys, you have consumer class actions. Now, what are those? That is when a group of consumers who have been harmed by um, some kind of wrongdoing. They group together as a as a uh, as a as a group of litigants, and they collectively bring an enforcement action uh, against a, a business, a, a lawsuit against a business. And those actions can be very significant indeed. Um, you will find that um, you know the settlements can sometimes run into millions if not tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars um, bec often because of the width and the breadth of the number of consumers that have gathered together to um, bring these kinds of class actions and so you'll find that uh, attorneys in the US are very very worried about ever being exposed to uh, these kinds of actions and that will drive a lot of um, their, uh, um, their compliance behavior. Over in the European Union uh, how does it work? Well, at a pan-European level, um, we have. Let me take a step back. Privacy enforcement in the EU is principally dealt with at a national level. I mentioned earlier that every authority has at least one data protection authority, and those data protection authorities are responsible for enforcing data protection breaches within their territory. Um, so the the you know the information commissioner's office in the UK is responsible for enforcing breaches of UK data protection law. What is increasingly starting to happen is that there is more sort of pan-European level, um, pan -European level um, enforcement. And what's happening is that these national data protection authorities are essentially clubbing together. And although they can't bring enforcement at a European level individually, what they can do is coordinate the individual national level enforcements they bring. Um, you know, a great example of this, for example, was the, the kind of Google Wi-Fi gate um, uh, enforcement across the EU, where uh, Google, when it rolled out, um, when it when it was rolling out its Street View cars to kind of you know collect photos of uh, and sort of map the map various European countries for its Google Maps product. Um, as part of doing that, what they also did was to co uh, collect. Um, Wi-Fi data from um, from the the homes and the businesses that they were passing, and that was seen as an infringement of privacy throughout multiple EU member states. And the data protection authorities effectively got together and they agreed that they would bring enforcement against Google uh, over this. Now the enforcement had to be dealt with at a national level, but they communicated, they shared information, and they generally took a sort of joint approach in the way that they coordinated their national actions. Um, so a good example that uh, we're starting to see sort of more coordination between the DPAs to bring enforcement throughout a European wide level. Below the national level we do have of course in various member states there will be sector specific regulators so for example you'll find um, you know in most, in most countries uh, financial services regulators will have the ability to bring certain enforcements for mishandling of um, individual you know, account data, for example. It's not a data protection issue per se, it's a financial services legal or regulatory issue, but they, you know, it clearly overlaps with um, privacy and data protection. And so those regulators have the ability to bring enforcement. And then at a consumer level, there is the ability for um, individuals to bring consumer actions against businesses for breaches of their data protection where they have been harmed. But in practice, those actions are very, very rare uh, for two reasons. One, we don't really have a class action regime in the EU. And secondly, you know, legal actions are very expensive. They're very, very expensive to bring. And uh, particularly in privacy, they very seldom result in a damages award. And so there hasn't really been any kind of incentive for uh, individuals to bring civil lawsuits against uh, non-compliant businesses. Um, Now let's have a look at the cost of getting it wrong. Uh, 
again, you know, uh, poor old Google having a bit of a bad time of it. Um, they, uh, if those of you have who have iPhones out there, you may be familiar that the iPhone by default blocks the setting of third-party uh, cookies. Now, um, what happened in this particular instance was that Google had actually created a workaround from through that where uh, they were able to set Google Analytics cookies on people's phones notwithstanding the fact that um, the Apple iPhone Safari browser actually blocked the setting of those cookies or was supposed to block the setting of, th of those cookies. Um, Google had developed that workaround and they immediately faced uh, enforcement in a few countries, uh, most notably the US, where the FTC said this was an unfair or deceptive practice. Individuals who had a Safari browser did not expect cookies to be third-party cookies to be set on their, brow uh, on their browser. Google was doing that nevertheless, and so the FTC brought charges against Google, and Google, to settle those charges, had to pay $22.5 million. Now contrast that with European data protection enforcement where most data protection authorities in the EU seldom impose fines that exceed more than a few hundred thousand pounds or hundred thousand euros. Uh, so really a much more substantive risk of serious enforcement in the US than the EU. So having looked at that, we've probably seen that the risk of enforcement, whether through FTC action or through consumer class actions, is actually probably greater in the US uh, than the EU. But maybe the EU has a, a more straightforward regime um, than the, the EU. It's a more comprehensive regime than the US. Um, and, you know, as Peter Fleischer said, as a simpler narrative, uh, a, perhaps a stricter regime, a stricter at least in the letter of the law, but perhaps not as aggressively as it enforced as is the case in the US. Now, if you're talking to US counterparts about European data protection law and trying to understand the, 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 the differences with US rules, I just wanted to flag here a few key examples. Um, the first is the concept of personally identifiable information versus personal data. Um, your US colleagues and US counterparts, they will talk about personally identifiable information in Europe the term is personal data now and it's not just a it's, it's not just a naming thing um, generally when you speak to US lawyers you'll find that when they talk about personally identifiable information what they are thinking of are you know sort of real world identifiers so they're thinking of names and contact details and email addresses and telephone numbers and those sorts of things in Europe when we say personal data that actually has a much broader definition uh, basically meaning any information that r relates to an identified or identifiable uh, living individual and it can include things like IP addresses or the unique device identifier on your mobile phone or cookie strings. Those are all things that in the US, um, US privacy people wouldn't tend to consider to be personally identifiable information although that's maybe starting to change but in Europe uh, our regulators very much consider those types of information as being personal data. Um, so a practical tip if you ever happen to be drafting any uh, sort of global privacy policies my general tip to um, to people there is you know if I were you I would avoid the term personally identifiable information because it's too US centric I would avoid the term personal data because it's too European centric and I'll maybe try to, try to strike a neutral term like personal information when you're using that language within privacy policies. Now another key difference is the concept of sensitive personal information. Generally both in the US and the EU information that is considered to be sensitive attracts a higher level of protection than just sort of non-sensitive personal information. In Europe, sensitive personal information has a very specific definition. It's literally a list of particular types of information. And it includes um, racial or ethnic origin, it includes health information, it includes Im information about uh, alleged or actual criminal offences, um, religious or philosophical beliefs, uh, and trade union membership. Um, in it's, so it's that very specific defined list. Now, in the US, they, there is actually no sort of written down list of what is sensitive personal information. 
what is considered sensitive is generally um, takes more account of context in the US. You know, it actually sort of what would you what would you ought reasonably to treat as sensitive personal information? And so in the US, you will typically find that Americans will treat things like social security numbers or bank details or child's children related data as being sensitive personal information and afford it a higher level of protection because of that. Very curiously, although European rules in many respects are stricter than some of the rules that exist in the US, um, we, uh, we don't define social security numbers or bank details or children's data as being sensitive. Uh, legally, they're not sensitive data. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't treat them as though they are sensitive. You know, on a, on a pure uh, objective level, they are clearly very sensitive um, categories of information, but legally they're not categorized as such, and that's one important difference. The next important difference is uh, restrictions on international data exports. Now, in the European Union, we have a restriction, it's under Article 25 of the Directive, about sending any personal data outside of the European economic area unless there are certain legal solutions in place. So you may have heard of model clauses or safe harbor or binding corporate rules. But unless you have one of those solutions in place, you are not allowed to send personal information outside of the EU. And the thinking there on the part of sort of European legislators and regulators was that um, they were concerned that companies might try to move data outside of Europe and say, well, once it's outside of Europe, European law no longer applies. So the way of preventing that was saying, well, you can't move this data outside of Europe unless you have ensured that it will continue to be held to European level standards. The US, by contrast, has absolutely no restrictions on international data exports. Um, so there are no blanket prohibitions against sending personal information from the US elsewhere. And that creates, um, that, that if in Europe, that creates real problems. If you are a business and you are, um, I don't know, running a call center that's outsourced to India, and that call center is going to access customer records, that's an international transfer of personal information. So you need to make sure that there is some lawful mechanism by which you can send the your data from Europe to that Indian call center. The US has no such equivalent requirement. A couple of other important differences. Um, the first is the role of consent. Um, now, in the US, it's very, very common practice for uh, businesses uh, to collect consent from individuals to the use of their personal information and typically the way they will do that is that somewhere within some terms of use or very deep within a privacy policy there will be something that says by using this service or by using this website you agree that we may uh, collect and use and share and deal with your personal information and in the US by and large that works. The, the, the unfair and deceptive practices regime that the FTC uh, oversees basically says um, that you know, if you've disclosed something to consumers and they've agreed to it, you know, then then that then that's okay. You can do what um, what you have disclosed to consumers with their personal information. Now that doesn't really work as well in the EU, and the reason for that is that the European Union has more of a paternalistic approach to data protection. Essentially, um, it kind of I suppose operates on the basis that um, sometimes consumers don't know or individuals don't know what's best for them. Um, so you can't just rely on people to consent to something because, um, you know, individuals, the, the consent that may, may be sought may not be a valid consent under European law. And in particular, we have a very specific um, definition of consent in the EU. Uh, European data protection law actually says that consent must be a freely given, specific and informed indication of wishes. Now, what that means is that burying a, a, cons a consent language deep within a privacy policy or within terms of service actually won't operate to get an effective consent because you know if it's buried that deep it's not if it's not immediately visible to the um, the consumer or the or the individual then they've never really been informed about it equally a blanket consent that you know you agree that we may do whatever we like with your information isn't valid in the EU because it's not specific enough or if you're an employer and you're trying to get your employee to agree to uses of their personal information, uh, again, an employee consent typically won't be valid in Europe because um, it won't be considered to be freely given. 
because there's a natural duress that exists in the relationship between an employer and an employee. An employee will always consent because they're worried about losing their job if they don't, so it's not a freely given consent. Now, the good news is that in Europe, you don't actually need to get consent in many cases to collect and use personal information. There are other lawful grounds that enable you to do so, and in particular, this thing, uh, the concept of legitimate interest, so where a business or a data controller has a legitimate interest in collecting the personal information. Uh, it can, it can, with it, and that interest isn't overridden by the rights of the individual. Then they're allowed to collect and use that information without consent. But that requires a very careful balancing act between what the business is proce- intending to do and the rights of the individual to expect um, that not to happen or to have their right, their, their data protection rights protected. So the the general rule of thumb is in the EU. Don't rely on consent to collect and use information because there's a good opportunity, a good, good chance it won't be valid, um, and that's a real difference from the approach in the US. Uh, the next point to consider is data retention. Um, again, there are no sort of um, strict requirements in the EU, uh, sorry, in the US about how long you can retain personal information for, and so what you'll find is that a lot of the um, a lot of US businesses will hold uh, personal information on an indefinite basis once they've collected it. Um, subject to sort of you know the cost of storage or whatever. In Europe, we actually have a requirement that personal information must not be held for longer than is necessary. And there's a bit of a debate about what necessary means, and of course necessary depends on the type of information you collected it and the reasons you might need to hold on to it. But there is a rule that at some point in time you are expected to delete that personal information. You can't just hold on to it forever. That's not the case in the US. And finally, e-marketing and cookie rules. Very different approaches between the EU and the US. Um, In the EU, if you're sending any kind of email or SMS marketing, then you generally require consent for that, unless um, there are very limited rules where you can rely on opt-out rather than consent, but the general principle is that you've got to get consent. And likewise, if you're serving cookies through a website, again, you have to get individuals' consent to those cookies. So as you browse around web websites in the European Union, if you see that, those kinds of cookie banners that come up that say, you know, we this site uses cookies for advertising and analytics purposes, and by continuing to browse the website, you agree to our use of cookies. Um, that's where that comes from. Europe has this cookie consent rule. In the US, uh, you know, there, there's no requirement to get consent. E-marketing can generally take place on an opt-out basis. There is no general cookie consent law in the US, although there is uh, increasingly regulatory expectation that individuals have to be op- able to opt out of targeted online advertising. Um, and so basically both e-marketing and cookies in the US are now sort of subject to opt-out expectations, whereas in the EU, uh, the, requ- the expectation would be consent. So. Bearing that all in mind, let me go back to my original question. Uh, The EU has stricter rules than the US, true or false? Well, after everything you've heard, um, you know, I'll leave you to form your own view on that. But since I'm here, I'll give you mine. There are certain aspects of um, the EU that uh, that are more comprehensive than the US. You know, we have laws that apply throughout the entirety of the EU. They apply throughout the entirety of any personal information, regardless of sector. Um, we have some important concepts like the role of consent in e- e-marketing, um, and you know, a broad concept of personal data that extends to device-related information. But then, by contrast, um, you know, the US has. Uh, you know, has much stricter enforcement by the FTC. It has a much greater risk of civil lawsuit under class action regimes. They have a more flexible concept of what sensitive personal information is. And so, the way I tend to think about it is that one regime is not necessarily better or worse than the other. They are really just two sides of the same coin. So with that, I will say thank you very much to listening for, um, for, for listening to this presentation. Uh, I've put my details up on this slide. If you have any questions, then do please get in touch. I would only be too happy to answer them. And thank you once again for your time today.